the Saber Timmy 53 study. Dr. Batman. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Harold and Dr. Badman. It's really a pleasure to be here today and to present the results of the Saber Timmy 53 trial. The primary objective was to determine whether, when added to background therapy, saxagliptin would be non inferior to placebo for the composite endpoint of cardiovascular death, non fatal myocardial infarction, or non fatal ischemic stroke with an upper 95% confidence interval of the hazard ratio of less than 1.3, as mandated by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, and if non-inferiority were met, to then determine if saxagliptin would be superior to placebo for that same endpoint. The design of saber 53 is as follows. 16,492 patients with documented type 2 diabetes and either established cardiovascular disease or multiple risk factors were randomized in a one-to-one -one double-blind fashion to either placebo or saxagliptin 5 milligrams a day in patients whose GFR was less than or equal to 50 milliliters per minute, 2.5 milligrams per day was used. Patients were followed up every six months until the final visit. This was an event-driven trial powered for 1,040 primary endpoints that resulted in a median study duration of 2.1 years. The loss to follow-up was only 0.2%. Withdrawal of consent was 2.4 percent. The primary endpoint was cardiovascular death, MI, or ischemic stroke, and the major secondary endpoint was that primary endpoint plus hospitalization for heart failure, unstable angina, or coronary revascularization. These are the main results of SAVER TIMI 53 for the primary endpoint of cardiovascular death, MI, or ischemic stroke. The rate of events was 7.3 percent with saxagliptin and 7.2 percent with placebo, resulting in a hazard ratio of 1.0, an upper bound to the 95 percent confidence interval of 1.12, and a p-value of less than 0.001, meeting the FDA criteria for non-inferiority. The p-value for superiority was 0.99. So in conclusion, when added to standard of care in patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus at high cardiovascular risk, saxagliptin neither reduced nor increased the risk of the primary composite endpoint of cardiovascular death, MI, or ischemic stroke, thereby fulfilling the FDA mandate for non-inferiority. In addition, saxagliptin improved glycemic control, decreased the need for insulin and other diabetes medications, increased hypoglycemic events, though not hospitalization for hypoglycemia, prevented progression of microalbuminuria, and did not increase the risk for pancreatitis or pancreatic cancer. Regarding the heart failure finding that's been alluded to already, the higher incidence of hospitalization for heart failure was unexpected, but it was a predefined adjudicated endpoint. Therefore, it does merit further evaluation given the history of other diabetic agents and heart failure. And indeed, additional analyses are ongoing, and preliminary data suggest that the risk is highest in those with elevated baseline clinical risk for heart failure, such as a history of prior heart failure, and or elevated BNP levels at baseline. And even in these high-risk subgroups, even though the incidence of heart failure is high and the absolute excess risk of heart failure is highest, there is no excess that is significant in either the primary endpoint, the secondary endpoint, or all-cause mortality. What are the implications of this trial? Well, I think it demonstrates the importance of performing large clinical trials with clinical endpoints, clinical cardiovascular endpoints for diabetes drugs, something that to date hasn't been done in a thorough fashion. Nevertheless, further research is still needed to more fully explore the relationship between lowering of hemoglobin A1C and the impact on cardiovascular outcomes, certainly that relationship in reducing microvascular outcomes, things like blindness, kidney failure, have been demonstrated in other older trials. But that relationship with cardiovascular outcomes still remains elusive. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Bat. This paper is now open for discussion. Uh, questions? In the back over there. Can we wait for the microphone, please? Can you identify your uh, organization okay. and name, please? Um, Aude Le Corbier from the Herb.org France. Um, I was wondering what were the differences between the populations of the Examine trial and the Savartimi trial? That's a good question. So first of all, I would say that the overall results are more similar than dissimilar. Both, trial, both trials were powered for a primary endpoint 
of um, ischemic events and neither found an excess, neither found a benefit. So I think that's really the main message for the drugs and I would be reasonably comfortable extrapolating to the entire class of DPP-4 inhibitors. Now, uh, there were some differences in the findings in as much as we did see uh, an excess of heart failure, but we also looked for heart failure. That is, it was a pre-specified adjudicated endpoint. And I think if one looks, one finds sometimes in life in clinical trials, I think it's difficult to go back when data um, don't have adjudicated pre-specified endpoints and find out things. Because, for example, in SABRE, if we look at adverse event or significant adverse event reporting as it pertains to heart failure or edema, in fact, we don't see any signal there. So it was only through careful adjudication, you know, that heart failure was apparent. Uh, with respect to hypoglycemia, that also was increased in our trial and not the other, but it was a larger trial. Uh, we had three times the number of patients. We had approximately twice the number of events, and that gave us a lot more statistical power in addition to the fact that the median duration was about six months longer in SAVER versus EXAMIN. So I think those differences in trial design likely account for the differences in the finding as opposed to some fundamental difference in two drugs in the same class. I would anticipate uh, if a larger trial were done of the other drug for longer uh, with uh, more care careful ascertainment of some of those endpoints, similar signals would have been seen with respect to the heart failure and the hypoglycemia. The one other difference in patient populations is that was a post-acute coronary syndrome trial. These were patients with stable cardiovascular disease or multiple risk factors in addition to diabetes. Question. Hi, I'm Michael Reardon from, from the heart.org. Um, I was wondering if you could address Larry's question, Dr. Bad, about the sort of where you see this drug fitting in or if you see it fitting in in clinical practice. Yeah, to be honest, I thought uh, uh, Larry did hit the nail on the head. I think that's what most cardiologists will ask. Okay, so a drug is non-inferior to placebo. Why would I use it? Uh, especially if there's cost and, and, and other associated side effects that are present with all drugs. And I think that's a legitimate question from a cardiovascular perspective, and that's why I ended saying that we need, as a field, diabetologists, cardiologists, to do more research to see what can we do to reduce the high rate of macrovascular events, heart attacks and strokes in diabetic patients. And what's clear is that neither of these drugs, and I'd be willing to say any of the DPP-4 inhibitors, uh, don't seem to impact favorably on cardiovascular outcomes. In this intermediate term follow-up, on the one hand, these were two large trials, uh, SABRE in particular, uh, uh, quite large, uh, reasonably long-term follow-up, but it wasn't a decade-long follow-up in 20,000 patients. And those might be the sort of studies that are needed to show a benefit of hemoglobin A1C reduction on cardiovascular outcomes. Who's going to do and fund those studies remains an open question, but scientifically still an important one. The other part, the flip side of the coin, is microvascular events. And neither of these trials was designed uh, to assess the impact on microvascular outcomes. Again, that would have required different designs, longer-term follow-up. Both trials were primarily designed to assure that there was cardiovascular safety of diabetes drugs that were already on the market and in use. And the impact of lowering hemoglobin A1C on microvascular outcomes from older studies is quite strong. Now, if we're going to challenge that fundamental assumption, then Larry's question is right. Why would you use something if it's non inferior to placebo? But the belief is that that lowering of hemoglobin A1C, if it can be done safely without causing heart attacks, should still result in the benefits in terms of endpoints like blindness and kidney failure and amputation, very clinically important ones. Of course, neither study was powered to look at those endpoints, so we can't say in a self-contained study that uh, these drugs or this class of agents by lowering hemoglobin A1C specifically lowers microvascular events. So there is a little bit of an assumption that the older data with other classes of agents applies to this newer class of agents with respect to microvascular outcomes. But we did see in SAVER a signal of that with respect to microalbuminuria being reduced. Other questions? Dr. Bat, can you further comment on the clinical uh, outcomes with the heart failure admissions, uh, the severity and uh, how difficult they, were they to manage? Sure, that's a great question, and, you know, I think um, it's interesting, the perspective we had our investigators meeting last night, the perspective of endocrinologists and cardiologists. So the endocrinologists largely thought these were terrific data. It shows that it doesn't cause heart attacks. It safely lowers blood glucose. Uh, 
and they didn't think that the small uh, imbalance in absolute terms of 0.7 percent excess in hospitalization for heart failure in the absence of any uh, increase in mortality, you know, the endocrinologists didn't seem that worried. The cardiologists, of course, sort of thought what Larry said and what you were alluding to, well, it doesn't improve cardiovascular outcomes, and then there is this um, a signal of heart failure. So as best we could tell, it is an increase in hospitalization for heart failure, in absolute terms, 0.7 percent control versus saxagliptin. Uh, there wasn't, even in those patients with excess heart failure, any signal that we could detect of excess all-cause mortality or cardiovascular mortality, nor was there any difference uh, that was significant in the primary endpoint or the secondary endpoint of the trial. So a fair amount of statistical power, especially as one moves to the secondary endpoint. I think it's also important to put into context that hospitalization for heart failure was one component of a secondary endpoint that was neutral. So that's not to say that the heart failure wasn't there. It was, and indeed, the investigators believe that finding. We think it's an important finding. But again, viewed in the larger context, this was also seen with TZDs, rosiglitazone and pioglitazone, which can cause a small excess in heart failure, believed largely uh, to be due to volume excess triggering heart failure. And perhaps, this is me speculating on mechanism, something similar is in play with this class of compounds where maybe they cause in some patients a little bit of volume retention so that if a patient is susceptible to heart failure, he or she might be tipped over into overt heart failure enough to be hospitalized but potentially not enough to result in mortality. But that's just speculative. It, it, it's hard to know from a clinical trial what those mechanisms might be of inducing heart failure. Well, thank you, Dr. Pat. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll move ahead. Now, uh